The second speaker of today's uh, session is Jesus De Loera from UC Davis, and he's going to talk about extreme behavior in linear programs and the simplex method. Thank you, Jesus, please. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming to, to this talk. I know for some of you it's very late, and I appreciate it. And, and some, for some of us, it's very early. So greetings from California. So, and I want to thank the organizers for putting together this wonderful conference. It's been a pleasure. So uh, I'm going to mostly talk about results that are coming in three papers that are joint work with these wonderful people. So the first paper is, uh, the first two papers are on the first half of the talk or the first results of the talk, which is with uh, on lengths of monotone paths. Uh, Moise Blanchard and Quentin Louveau and then Sean Kafer and Laura Sanita. And then on the second half of the talk, I will talk about a paper with uh, Christos Atanasiadis and Zhen Zhen Zhang. All right, so let's get going. So this talk is about the mathematical challenges of the simplex method. I don't need to explain the simplex method to this audience, but I'm I will just reference one, some geometry of the simplex method very quickly so that everybody understands. And of course, there are similarities with the previous talk, but there are a lot of differences from the previous talk. So you will see. So again, so the simplex method for me is this algorithm that starts at the vertex of the feasible region, which we all know is a convex polytope or a convex polyhedron. And it has a directed path. It's a directed graph because I have my objective function orients the edges. And, and I, I have an, a directed monotone path that moves from some vertex all the way to the, to the optimum, right? So I want to understand this directed path. So for me, the direction is going to be more relevant and as I will argue in a moment, there's a difference from the undirected case that we saw in the previous talk. So, so again, when you have a, an, an objective function, I'm going to assume in that my objective function is generic. Okay, so that means that uh, all my edges are oriented. Uh, I mean, my graph is a directed, a cyclic, and every face has a unique sink and a unique source. So that's what is going to happen for generic uh, objective functions. Okay. And of course, you know, if you have a non-generic objective function, you, you can always move an epsilon and you are in a generic case. All right, so the situation. And uh, so here I'm showing some two orientations of the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. So of course, the, I mean, we all love the, the simplex method. I can argue actually that without the simplex method, we wouldn't be here right now, but uh, we still don't understand it. So for example, is there a version of simplex method that runs in polynomial time in the input size? We don't know the answer to this question. So in my presentation today, I will ar argue two natural mathematical questions about this que about, the, about the efficiency of the simplex method. And, and so my, my, the first question is, is related to the previous talk. So I'm interested, of course, on what are the possible lengths for the monotone paths of the, on the polytope? So remember, so I have this directed graph that is given to me by the objective function. And I'm interested in the lengths of these monotone paths. For example, how long can they get? Can they get very long? Can they, go, can they be all short? What's, what can I know about this? So the second, the second question is a more purely mathematical question, but it's also not completely impractical. How many monotone paths are there? So do I have many options that are short to get to the optimal solution? So I will be very interested on, on counting the monotone paths and I will be very interested to understand the extrema linear programs. So what are linear programs that have a lot of monotone paths, all right? So the, the point, the, the, the plan of attack that I'm proposing today is to, to study all possible monotone paths. So I'm gonna study the entire set in some sense. I want to try to have a global view of the set of monotone paths. All right, is everybody clear? So my plan for the rest of my time is to uh, talk about the lengths First, tell you some results about lengths of monotone paths. And then I'm going to tell you results about counting monotone paths. So let's start with lengths. So first of all, I want to remind you, so I have a directed path. So this directed path gamma. Uh, so what do I mean by the length? So yeah, so I, I, start, I start from a vertex. So I start from a vertex, and I'm going to the optimal vertex, right? My optimal vertex is unique because my objective function is generic. So I have the. I have to count the number of arcs on the path. That's the length of the path for me, okay? 
Now, I want to emphasize right away something. This depends on the objective function. If, if, if Carla chooses a different objective function than I choose, the answer for the lengths will be different, right? So the, the, this is very LP dependent. This is not just a, an intrinsic property of the polyhedron, like in the previous talk, it was more intrinsic of the polyhedron itself. Uh, here, the objective function matters. So then I can talk about the C diameter or the C monotone diameter. I should call it the C monotone diameter, which is the maximum length of the shortest C monotone path that I can take from, you know, fr from a vertex to the optimum, okay? So, and then I'm taking this maximum over all possible starting vertices, right? Because I have a unique sink. And then there's a, co a concept that has been studied since the 1960s, but people have forgotten about this definition. For many years, for the recent last 10 years or so, we have been talking about diameter, 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 but there's also the notion of height. How bad can things really, really can get on a, on a simplex method, right? Uh, so this is the length of the longest monotone paths that I can have on the simplex method. Are you with me? These concepts are gonna be in the exam. Are there any questions so far? I hope it's, everything is okay. All right. So, so then of course, again, as I said, this depends on the objective function. I can also study the, the maximum over all objective functions of these quantities, right? For example, the monotone diameter will be the maximum over all possible objective functions. What do I get? Or I can also talk about the, the monotone height when I take the maximum C height over all possible objective functions. Now, I want to give you caution of these quantities because uh, you know, I just want to tell you that this is not so easy, right? So already in the 1980s, Barahona and Tardos, and later we gave a different proof in this paper with Sean and, and Laura uh, that finding the shortest monotone path on a particular objective function is MP hard. Okay, I mean, in fact, unless on, on p is equal to p, it's, it's hard to approximate within a factor of two. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's just to caution you that computing these quantities is not going to be so easy. All right, and so I he, here's a little example. So everybody knows the Klimt cube. So these are bad examples for the simplex method re regarding the famous pivot rules. I mean, like Danzig pivot rule and uh, greatest improvement pivot rules and all these. So I um, so I, I chose this example because here is the fam most famous example of a of a long monotone path, right? So you have this in the Klimt cube. You have this uh, monotone path that pass through every single vertex, right? But in reality, the Klimt cubes. I mean, the you can find in in the monotone diameter. You can find the, everything. You can reach a, a distance d, just the dimension. So. I want to say that it's very important, and this has to do with the, with the previous talk. And let me just say, say it here. So there's, there's differences between the, the undirected case and the monotone directed case, right? So, and I want to show you just two differences. So the first difference is uh, that if you look at particular examples, uh, we know the, the, diame the undirected diameter so let's look at, look at the undirected diameter the, for the Birkhoff polytope. So for the Birkhoff polytope, or if you like the assignment polytope, if you prefer that name. So the, the undirected diameter is two. For the monotone diameter for the, for the Birkhoff polytope is n over two. And in this talk, I will show you the monotone height. Well, I mean, a lower bound the monotone height. So, it, it is is dramatic difference. It has a dramatic difference, and so this is something that people in the 1960s, my my academic grand uh, grandfather Victor Klee, uh, already studied in the 1960s, and 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 he noticed this very very dramatic difference, and he posed a lot of questions about the height and the diameter and the monotone diameter. So in the 1990s, Rispoli and collaborators they studied a lot of combinatorial polytopes. For example, he was the first to to find the monotone diameter of the Birkhoff polytope. So, but another difference that I want to emphasize is that we know that for the undirected case, the Hirsch conjecture is false, right? So that was the great achievement of Francisco Santos. He found, now we know a 20 dimensional counterexample for that. 
but uh, but I want to remind everybody that Michael Todd, Michael Todd actually gave a counterexample to the directed case in 1980, right? So the, this is the dimension four case. And I, I can argue that the directed case is more closely related to the, to the simplex method to some extent. All right, so first, so let me tell you the theorems before I run out of time. So enough of introduction. So the, let me start telling you the results. Hopefully you will get excited to, to uh, read the papers and ask me questions later. So the first results are negative. This is, this is about the heights. I'm talking about the longest paths that you can have on the polytope. I mean, we all know about the zero one, uh, sorry, the Clementi cube, the Clementi cube, right? But the Clementi cube is a, it's a nasty LP, right? So you would like to know whether can there be nasty long walks on the long paths on combinatorial polytopes. So from now, I'm gonna try to tell you things for polytopes that you think are nice, like the matching polytope or the, you know, well, maybe the TSP polytope is not necessarily nice, but I mean, the shortest path polytope and such. So here are some nasty results about them. So the, the matching polytopes, the perfect matching polytope, the fractional matching polytope, all of these for the complete graph Kn, they have actually uh, exponential behavior. So the, the height is at least, uh, let's draw, it's, it's here, uh, so you, you know the number of vertices is n factorial. So actually we do not know, it's an open question whether you can make a, a monotone path or some, for some objective function that actually passes through all the vertices. And I don't think that's possible actually, but this is the best we can do. So similarly for the TSP and the perfect matching and the two perfect matching polytope for the complete graph, we have an exponential uh, height. We can construct a long, long, long monotone path, uh, but here we need to use uh, the golden ratio actually for constructing this uh, exponential path. And there's, there's also exponential paths for the shortest path polytope of the complete graph. So, so nasty things can happen even if, this, if you have zero one, you don't have to be Clementi to have long, long monotone paths on, on, some, on some objective function. And constructing these objective functions is not, is, is requires some care. So the constructions are delicate. All right, but at the same time, if you are a combinatorial polytope, you might be able to bound the, the, the polynomial monotone diameter. And that's exactly what I mentioned. Rispoli in the 90s, he bound, the, for example, he bound the, the, the diameter, the monotone diameter of the Birkhoff polytope. Uh, so we wanted to see um, what happens in other polytopes, in other combinatorial polytopes. So we have uh, two, two corollaries. I'm, I'm talking to here about corollaries because I'm not have, I don't have time to show you the, the general theorem. Uh, the general theorem says, well, I mean, I'll, it actually has to do with sonotopes. So this, I'm very excited to see the previous talk because I think it, it's connected, highly connected to sonotopes because this corollary is here, says that when you have a matroid polytope or even if you have a polymatroid, then the diameter is always uh, bounded by n choose to the, the number of, um, uh, the monotone diameter is bounded by n choose to the number of elements of the, of the matroid in this case will be the, end, the number of elements of the matroid. In some sense, this is related to the number of generators of the sonotope that, that uh, Norijoshi had in his talk. I mean, similarly, if you look at transportation polytopes, I mean, this is one of the most classical LPs we have in studying since the 1940s. For the monotone diameter, the best we can do right now is actually, if you have a K by N transportation polytope, K by N, and K is fixed, you know, you fix one of the sides of the, of the transportation polytope, then you can, you can bound, uh, you can bound the height, but, um, sorry, no, this is supposed to be the, the monotone diameter. This is supposed to be the monotone diameter. Uh, you can bound the monotone diameter, but, uh, but it depends on K, right? So it grows badly on K. And so in general, for example, we know that the Hirsch conjecture, the undirected case is true for transportation polytopes. That's a, a, a work that I did uh, with, with Borbart and Fly, uh, Fly, uh, Feilsner that uh, we don't know what happens in the monotone version. Yeah. All right, so consequences for the combinatorial, for some combinatorial polytopes, we started looking uh, in the paper with uh, Moise and Kentan, we look at specific pivot rules. We're starting looking at specific pivot rules. 
So you can think of the diameter, the monotone diameter for when the paths that you use have to follow the rules of the of some people's rule. So you are more restricted, right? So the, obviously the if you do that, the length is going to be uh, bigger than the general monotone paths, right? So the, the the monotone diameter is less than the monotone diameter restricted to some particular pivot rule. But nevertheless, uh, um, I have you you have the following results for this combinatorial polytope. So for example, the 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 fractional perfect matching polytope, the and the Birkhoff polytope, the shortest path polytopes, all these polytopes, they have actually nice uh, polynomial size, uh, steepest, so steepest edge or Danzig and greatest improvement people, um, number of steps on the on the on their on on their paths. Okay. So we can actually see that the, the paths on these pivot rules are gonna be well behaved. Um, the the one thing that we can, oh, by the way, this is everything I'm saying is modulo degeneracy. So you, you might, in other words, the, 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 the improvement steps that you make regarding the, this is an issue because sometimes you may stop, you know, you have degeneracy like in the TSP. So then, you know, you have a, a lot of uh, steps that are degenerate. But when you do an improvement, the number of improvements you are making is polynomially bounded. So in more general case, in this new paper with, uh, with Sean and Laura, so we proved that the, using the steepest, steepest edge arcs, any zero one polytope, you can have a polynomial size, uh, polynomial size diameter for zero one polytopes. And again, this is using the steepest edge edges uh, or the arcs. All right. So that's uh, the first half of my talk. I I want to go to the next half, but uh, I stop here for questions or comments. Sure, I have a question. Yes. Can you go back to the slide with the golden ratio on it? Yes. Uh, oops, sorry, where is the golden ratio here? Oops, not here. Yep. Uh, yeah. Is that really such a big lower bound? Because that, that polytope has an exponential number of facets, right? Yes. But so for example, the here, end. So this is really sublinear in a way. Uh, yes, but that's the best we can do so far. I mean, okay, so what, how many, let's see, if you have a very, very long path here, so you would like to have what, and the number of, of, uh, of possible vertices here, the number of, of monotone paths of, of uh, the TSP paths, right? You have N minus one factorial over two, right? Yeah, but even for two matching, you I mean, two matching, you really know how many facets there are, right? It's, let's order two to the n, two to the n minus one or something. So I'm saying right. like golden ratio to the n is not so big for the two yeah, matching. It's, it's not so big, I guess, co compared to the, yeah. John, I, I can, let's, I propose we take this offline because I think, uh, I want to at least show the other results. For sure, sure, of course, of course. Yeah. I so have then, a short question yes. too, <laughs> sorry. So these results are about uh, the complete graph. Uh, what about uh, other graphs? And also what's the impact of the generacy? So here, here is just, um, valid for the complete graph. We didn't look at other, other graphs. For example, if you delete some edges there, um, the genus in this case, we really are using the structure of the polytope as it is. We don't, we're not doing any perturbation really. It's mostly playing with the objective function. Yeah, but I guess since the polytopes are the generate uh, and you have characterizations of vertices, um, I guess there is uh, some more choice in choosing the next vertex where to move. So I was wondering if you maybe implicitly exploited this in the proof. Um, I don't think so, but le yeah, I have to go. The, the constructions are very different for for each of these for each of these mm -hmm. cases. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank we you. can talk about this on Slack. Thank you.
All right, so let's see. So now let me say something about the counting all monotone paths of LPs. So essentially what I'm interested here is uh, how many monotone paths can there be on an LP? That's what I'm interested. And here uh, also suppose that your life depends on generating all the monotone paths. What's a good way to do it? What's the structure of all the monotone paths? So I'm going to tell you an answer for that. So first of all, Without loss of generality, so remember monotone paths for me, they may start at any vertex and they go to the optimum. But I, I argue that without loss of generality, you can just count the monotone paths from the mean to the max. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm, from the rest of my talk, I'm just gonna, when I said the number of monotone paths, I'm just, just counting those that go from the minimum to the maximum. And here I'm showing you two examples of such paths. Trust me, you can reduce the general case to this case, okay? By some natural construction. All right, so there, there's a natural structure on the set of all monotone paths. This is what I want to, to publicize here. I don't think many people know about this. And this is when you have two monotone paths, you can define an adjacency by a flip, by a polygon flip. So two monotone paths are gonna be adjacent to each other. So there's gonna be, an edge between them, if they share, they are identical except on a two-dimensional phase. So here is an example. So these two, these two monotone paths are adjacent because there's this, this, this polygon where one of the monotone paths goes on, goes on the top of the polygon and the other one goes on the bottom part of the polygon. So you see the polygons are oriented exactly two possible ways, right? The, the two-dimensional polygons are exactly like, like that. I'm assuming this is a two-dimensional um, phase. So I can define this adjacency and then I can define a graph. So here is the, the flip graph of all the possible monotone paths of the, of the dodecahedron. So I have these 14 monotone paths, okay? These are all of them. Now, this is an amazing graph. It's an amazing graph for many reasons. So in the 1990s, Bilera, Capranos, and Sturfels, they actually proved that this graph is connected. So using this graph, you can generate all monotone paths, all of them. So it's, it's a way to generate all monotone paths. Uh, then more precisely in 2000, Atanasia, Edelman, and Reiner, they proved that this graph is D minus one connected for simple polytops. When you do that for simple polytops, when you have degeneracy, the graph can be bad. So it can be too, it's too connected in some cases. And it, so it can just become very, as, some, some paths are very isolated. You will never hit them in some sense. So in this talk, I wanted to just ask about so the most fundamental questions about this graph, which are how many vertices can there be for this graph, right? And, uh, and then I also want to know the diameter of this graph, right? Since we li like diameter so much. So I would like to understand, uh, yeah, I would like to understand what's the diameter uh, of, this, of, of this graph. So how many, how far apart are two monotone paths? Right? How far apart are the monotone paths by these flips that I, did, that I introduced? By the way, if you are a, somebody that lacks probability, you might also think of this as a, some kind of Markov chain, right? It's a way that you start with a monotone path and you can generate, you know, you do these random flips, and then you generate a random monotone path. And it's interesting to try to understand the, this distribution of monotone paths. All right, so I'm gonna tell you the results we have. So again, I'm gonna denote that uh, this is the number of monotone paths on a polytope with objective function f, because again, it depends on the objective function. And so we have answered completely the question in three dimensions, in three dimensions. Uh, well, you know, you have to start somewhere, right? You have to start somewhere. So three dimensionals polytopes, we know that the number of monotone paths cannot be larger. So it has to be always at least, sorry, n, n over two plus two, and that is actually tight, that is actually tight, but it's never more than the Tribonacci numbers, the Tribonacci numbers, if you're familiar with the Fibonacci numbers, so this is, uh, this is the, the natural generalization. So then the number Tn is given by the sum of the previous three numbers, right? And you start with T0, T1, so this is the how you start. So the Tribonacci numbers uh, are the, the best you can do. And uh, this is actually tight as well. So we know that this is, the, this is already the theorem for dimension three for general polytopes. Uh, now, 
in general, so if you have a, a polytope like the cyclic polytope, which is very famous, so you may have in dimension four and higher, you have a, a neighborly polytope. Every the, the graph is a connect is a is a um it's a complete graph, right? It's a complete graph. So you can go to any to, to any to any vertex in principle. So there you can actually find uh, paths to two to two to the n minus two possible monotone paths. You can do all connections, right? All possible monotone paths are possible. And uh, the lower bound is this, but this is not tight. So we don't know. We don't know whether this is there's a better lower bound, and I presume that there's a better lower bound in dimension d for the number of vertices of this graph. Now, finally, I, I will finish now. Is uh, what happens with the diameter? So we find uh, completely. Well, we answer the asymptotic. Uh, we have the asymptotic answer for dimension two, three for three-dimensional polytopes. The diameter of the of this flip graph is quadratic on on the number of vertices, and so we know that this is uh, this is the this is probably the correct the exact value. We believe that is n minus two square over four. Um, we think this upper bound is too too big. Still, we can tighten it, but at least the, you know it's quadratic for sure. All right. With that, I will thank you for your time and uh, take questions if I still have time. <laughs> Otherwise, we go to Slack. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the nice talk. We definitely have time for questions. So I already see a couple of questions in the chat and. Uh, uh, Please uh, type them uh, in the Q&A if possible, or otherwise I'll, I also look at the chat. Um, so Kartekeyan is asking, the lower bound on the height for TSP perfect to matching polytope is weaker than that for the matching polytope. Do you think that the height of TSP perfect to matching polytope should be at least that of the matching polytope? Yeah, so I guess that's related to John's question, right? In some sense. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I think definitely. So definitely, we think that we did poorly on the on the TSP. So we think it can be improved. We couldn't figure out another construction. And um, yeah, I I you know, I like to think that if you have a polytope that has very long things like the Clementi cube, you pass through every possible vertex, right? So. We were trying, in some sense, to do that for the TSP to pass through as many vertices as you can, for the for trying to achieve that. And this was the best construction we could find. I don't know whether using the matching polytope because they're very, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It might be closer. I mean, something better than that is what I will hope to see. Closer to n factorial, in some sense. Yes. And I see he has another question. Yes. No, on the number of minimum length and maximum length monotone paths. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I would love to. I have done some experiments on the distribution on the on the lengths. So you can you can make a, a distribution, right? Like a histogram of how many monotone paths are there of this length, how many monotone paths are these of this length or this other length. And you see, if you do this for the TSP, for example, you can see that this distribution of lengths is very peculiar. It's actually uh, it looks like a normal distribution, right? Uh, but it's a shifted mo normal distribution. So I, I, I think there's something to it. I mean, understanding the distribution of the possible lengths, the number of possible paths of different lengths, counting them, how do they look like? Uh, we don't know much more about this, but it's a very interesting question. Yes, I agree. There is uh, one more question from Joe Pat. He asks, suppose you have a lot Lattice polytope called the lattice L. Take a sublattice N of L. Does your analysis allow you to count how many times a path visits a certain coset of L N or N? No. Or oh, I guess L oh, over N. Maybe that maybe that's more for Nori Nori Joshi, I think maybe could be. But uh Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. The question was asked now, and Joseph says it's for anyone. Oh, for anyone. <laughs> Anybody. <laughs> no. Uh... no, these techniques don't don't really apply for that. And here, I don't use the lattice structure or the the coordinates of the ver of the of the vertices. Can I ask one more question? Do we have time? 
Yes, we do have time. So I'm interested in uh, the degenerate cases. So if I fix the objective function, say, and I fix the uh, leaving rule, by say the lexicographic rule, um, then can you say anything about lengths of paths on some of these combinatorial polytopes? Counting degeneracy. Uh, yes. So I, I rather, I'd rather talk to you about this offline, but yeah, so we, we think we, we might be able to say something at least in the case of steepest edge. So in some sense, okay, here is what you hope, John, that even if you have degeneracy, the number of non-degenerate steps is polynomially bounded. And that we can, we can guarantee happens in the, in the steepest edge. You don't know me so well. I prefer exponential uh, paths. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. I thought I knew you well, but so, yeah. So, so zero one polytos have this nice property that for sure you will be able to, uh, you know, when you improve, you improve polynomially many times, but you might get stuck on, on a, on a fighting the non-degeneracy for a while. And, and that's the catch, right? That we, we don't know how, how long you stay there. Thanks. <laughs>